All right, welcome to Caribbean Theology. This is the final class. We are reviewing some very important aspects of Caribbean theology towards a Caribbean, with, towards an examination which the students will sit. So this is a review of, of the class. Um, one of the, 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 one of the, in terms of, in terms of definitions that you will have to familiarize yourself with for an exam involved one, defining certain key terms such as theology, which is the study and contemplation of the divine and religious beliefs often conducted within a particular faith tradition. Um, when we talk about Caribbean theology, we're talking about the exploration and interpretation of religious concepts, beliefs, and practices within the concept of the Caribbean, the Caribbean regions, diverse cultures and histories. And when we talk about diverse cultures and histories, because it's not just oh, not just African ancestry we're talking about. There's, oh, say for example, v, um, V.S. Nepal, his ancestral home is India, because we also have experience with indentured servitude. So people from China, from India. And of course, there's all, now we are learning based on new study about many Africans, many people, many of us who think that the, Afri the, the, the Indians had died out. Many of them remained, okay? Um, many of them were infused with, especially with some of the Maroons that escaped after the Spanish um, fought the British. They freed, um, they freed just before the, Span the British took over, they freed the slaves that they had. And many of them, we are saying, could not have been African slaves. They must have been the natives who they freed and when by the time the African came, came to outnumber because 700 and over 750,000 African came from Africa to Jamaica and throughout the Caribbean, by the time they come to mix and mingle with the urban, with the Indians, then, um, but of course, what we have been told is that that was wiped out. But when we talk about Caribbean theology, we're exploring and interpreting, and interpreting concepts, religious concepts, beliefs, and practices within the context of the Caribbean region, diverse cultures that goes beyond just African ancestry and histories. When we talk about African Caribbean spirituality, it is spiritual beliefs and practices that's rooted in the African diaspora heritage found within the Caribbean region. We talk about liberation theology, the theological movement that seeks to address social, political, and economic oppression, often emphasizing the liberation of marginalized groups. When we talk about Obia, what we're talking about is an Afro-Caribbean spiritual practice involving various rituals, charms, and potions for healing, protection, and other purposes. Um, Eurocentrism, we're talking about a perspective that prioritizes, evaluate, and synthesize information and ideas. Sorry, it's a, it's a perspective that prioritizes European cultures, their history, and values as central and superior to other culture. So that's important to Caribbean, okay? And the study that we are conducting. Um, now, critical thinking is thinking about thinking and what was previously taught. It's the ability to analyze, to evaluate, to synthesize, um, to comb information and ideas objectively and logically with uh, within an understanding that history and its interpretation is a result of the varieties of human natures and circumstances. When we talk about hermeneutics from the margin, we're talking about an interpretive approach that gives voice to the marginalized, the marginalized perspectives and experiences in biblical theological studies. Now, the other question that we ask, we ask is if Jamaican revivalism is more similar to, to, to A, Obia, or B, Haitian voodoo. Of course, the answer is Haitian voodoo. Now, how does Caribbean theology encourage and reclaim cultural identity? So we ask several other um, questions in this regard. So the question is, by the way, from question three to seven, we answer only two questions from three to seven, only two. The question is, how does Caribbean theology encourage and reclaim Caribbean cultural identity? In the, one of the first classes that we did, some of you weren't there, 
Williams was there when we talk about uh, the dialogical, dialogical, um, critical, um, critical thinking in dialogic, the dialogical developing dialogue towards the logical, towards an understanding. You push things to its logical end through the dialogic. Say, for example, Socrates and Aristotle or Plato and so on, the dialogical. Okay. Um, we ask the question, how does Caribbean theology, and by the way, I, it, I reread that and I sent it to you in an, in an email. It's beautiful, it's deep. But the question is, how does Caribbean theology encourage and reclaim Caribbean cultural identity? Of course, when you define Caribbean theology, we said that one of the aims of Caribbean theology is that what? It, it, Caribbean theology and should, your definition of Caribbean theology should encourage and reclaim Caribbean cultural identity. And we talk about the Jews. We talked about the Jews, yes, and their cult, their theology, okay, and their practice of religion allows them to reclaim, to en encourages them and, and, and also provides an opportunity for them to reclaim their heritage, cultural heritage. In 1946, they went back to where? They reclaimed their cultural land, yes? So that is it. that's one of the importance of Caribbean theology, a, a, a theology of culture, a theology that speaks to the issue, to the culture, and so on and so forth. So we ask, so we ask, so that's one of the questions. You don't have to do that question, but you, you do too. You could do that one, or what is the role of critical thinking? Critical thinking dialogue, critical thinking dialogue in Caribbean theology. What is black liberation theology and how important is it to Caribbean theology? And what is the role of faith in advocating for justice and equality? And what is the challenge of Christian missions in Caribbean theology? Now, number seven is powerful. It's a powerful one. That one, I, it came to me. Why read? And I think one of the class we, we had, I think I referenced this book because some of you come to the class you have hazardly you may not remember me reading from this and sharing a little bit about this paradigm transforming missions paradigm shifts in theology of missions written by david j bosch powerful book and um and one of the things that i raised in one of the presentations i had with you guys or i don't know if you got but if you watch the video you will see it we talk about the challenge of missions and we talk about the issue of crusades so what is the challenge of, crusade, of Christian missions in Caribbean theology? When you think about the Rastafarianism and the Eurocentrism, you are already think of, thinking about the challenge. So you are to choose in this, so three, you are only to do two questions. You are only to do question in that section. Um, and one of the questions, so what, how do you answer the question? How does Caribbean theology encourage and reclaim Caribbean cultural identity? Caribbean theology emphasizes incorporating Caribbean culture. And by the way, I sat this exam. I did the exam and did it and then sat it. Same thing with any exam that I write for any student anywhere in the world, any class I've done, I first do it myself. I do it myself and time myself. So I did this exam and I wrote the script myself. Okay, just so you know, I, I wrote this exam. Um, so I can even email the script to you guys, or you can watch it. But it doesn't matter. But and see my answer sheets. But how does Caribbean theology encourage and reclaim Caribbean cultural identity? My answer: Caribbean theology emphasizes incorporating Caribbean culture, history, and traditions into theological discourse by integrating aspects of Afro-Caribbean spirituality. It helps reclaim indigenous beliefs and practices that were marginalized during the colonial era. Caribbean theology also empowers Caribbean people to interpret biblical texts from their own contexts, enabling them to draw connections between their cultural heritage and religious faith. This process fosters a sense of cultural identity, pride and self-determination among Caribbean communities Challenging the dominance of what? Eurocentrism in theological thought. If I were to ask you one of the goals of Caribbean theology is this last aspect, to challenge the dominance 
of Eurocentrism in theological thought. That is one of the aims of this course. Now, if you were to answer this question, what is black liberation theology and how important it is to Caribbean theology? The answer would be that black liberation theology emerged as a response to what? To racial oppression in the United States and emphasizes the liberation of black people from systemic justice. But this black liberation theology, although started in the United States, was influenced by the United Negro the, um, movement, UNIA, and Marcus Garvey. It was that very same movement that also gave rise to Rastafarianism during the Great, Impre uh, the Great Depression of the 1930s. So you can see the symbiotic relationship between people of the global south and those in the global north who are under subjugation or, or bear the vestiges of it. That's okay. So while Caribbean theology is distinct from black liberation theology, while Caribbean theology is distinct from black liberation theology, it shares common elements such as addressing colonial legacies and social inequalities in the Caribbean context. The importance of black liberation theology to Caribbean theology lies in its solidarity. Notice the word solidarity. And when we talk about solidarity, solidarity with, with, is always mar as a marriage with struggle. So Caribbean theology lies in, lies in its, the, the, the importance of black liberation theology to Caribbean theology lies in its solidarity with struggles against racial injustice and its emphasis on social transformation, which resonates with the Caribbean region's history of colonialism and oppression. Now, section two, in section two, I asked the question in section, I asked the question in section two, answer two questions in 2A and two from 2B. Two from 2A and two from 2B and one from 2C in no more than one paragraph. So answer two questions from 2A. What contributions, oh, by the way, um, is there anything I'm missing here? Okay, um, what contributions have two of the following made to Caribbean thought and theology? Uh, Marcus Garvey, Lewin Williams, Garnet Roper, Virgil Taylor, Adris Hamid, Lewin Williams, Noel Erskine, William Watty, Ashley Smith, Dottie Bookman, and Virgil Taylor. Kant describes history as a result of the varieties of human natures and circumstances. What is the significance of this philosophy? The Christian theology and Caribbean hermeneutics. Notice, if history is a result of the varieties of human nature and circumstances, then the way we then the way we understand Christian theology and Caribbean hermeneutics must be tailored by this particular philosophy and understanding, in the sense that human natures and whatever is happening within society or, or epochs give rise to how people interpret, understand, and lay, and lay claim to, to historical or significant events. In fact, there are those who say that history is for the future. Now, in question three, it said that the Caribbean is to be the Caribbean is an invention of the 20th century, which must be reinterpreted in the 21st century. What does this mean and how has theology influenced this invention? And what opportunities are there to reinvent itself? So let us let us look at a couple of these questions. Marcus Garvey. Let's look at um, let's look at these individuals one by one. 
Um, when we talk about Marcus Darby, who are we talking about? Um, first and foremost, Marcus Garvey is quite powerful and important to Black liberation theology, to nationalism. But we said that the difference between Marcus Garvey and George Padmore is the, the brand of nationalism that they advocated. Marcus Garvey played a significant role in Caribbean thought and theology. His advocacy for Black pride, self-reliance, and pan-Africanism inspired a sense of identity and dignity among Caribbean people. Bob Marley, through his music, brought Rastafarian ideas to the mainstream, encouraging Caribbean communities to embrace their cultural and spiritual heritage. Both Garvey and Marley contributed to the development of Caribbean thought by instilling a sense of cultural consciousness and unity among the religion's people. Um, Marcus Garvey is said to have started, um, is said to have provided the kind of, helped to provide the kind of music, the kind of liturgy within Rastafarianism. Um, so that's one of the persons we can choose. As it relates to Kant's philosophy of history, emphasizing human natures and circumstances. Now that have, has relevance to Christian theology and Caribbean hermeneutics. In Christian theology, this perspective highlights what? The historical events and the development of religious beliefs, which are influenced by the experiences and nature of human beings. Let me say this again. Let me, I'm gonna say this again. As it relates to Kant on history, and how that, and how significant Kant on history affects our hermeneutics and our theology within that is Caribbean. And the relevance it has to Christian theology. In Christian theology, this perspective highlights that historical events and the development of religious beliefs are influenced by the experiences and nature of human beings. For Caribbean hermeneutics, understanding historical contexts becomes crucial to interpreting religious texts, which allows Caribbean theologians to now reclaim their own theological narratives, their own theological narratives while challenging, which is the aim of this course, challenging what? Eurocentric interpretation that do not consider their unique historical experiences. Now, one of the, I ask a very important question in 2B. When you go to 2B, a very important question in 2B. Um, in 2B, I ask the question, what does Bob Marley, what does Bob Marley mean? By the way, question three, the Caribbean is said to be an invention of the 20th century, which must be reinvented in the 21st century. What does this mean? And how has theology influenced this invention? And what opportunities are there to reinvent it? Let me tell you, that is a most profound and powerful question. God gave me some of these things. I'm telling you, God just be giving me stuff. Sometimes I write stuff and I look back at it. Every time I write and I look back at it, I'm like, this is God. I'm telling you, I take nothing for myself. I don't grow. Everything is God. I'm telling you. The other, I say, God, give me content. He gives me content. Lord, as I write the students, the exam, guide me. He guides me. And I look at this question. What a powerful question. I mean, when I want you to delve into the questions. They are deep. They move you. They are reflective. That is why I don't want to take this exam or the question lightly. When I, you know, it's deep. It is introspective. It provides, you know, if you read Richard Foster's Celebration of Dis Discipline. Richard Foster, and I read that book, a powerful book. Richard Foster's Celebration of Discipline. And he talks about the... Uh, the discipline of solitude and so on. It's powerful. Socrates talked about the unexamined life is not worth living. This provides for a kind of reflection. That's, I love this exam paper. It's powerful. It challenges you as theologians. And you guys are all professionals. You guys are at a very important place in your life in Jamaica because you are doing empowerment work in Jamaica, all of you. This question is important. The Caribbean is said to be an invention of the 20th century, which must be reinvented in the 21st century. What does this mean? And how has theology, in, in, how has theology 
influence. Notice it. Notice the, there's something in this question. There's an assumption in the question. You notice the quote, the, there's an assumption or an assertion. Oh, okay. I said, how has theology influenced this invention? We said that Caribbean is, uh, the Caribbean is an invention, okay? Stemming from European arrival to, to the Caribbean, leading up to independence in the, in the 1960s and 70s for some countries, some people before that, okay? Leading up to that and created in the mold of the colonial master, okay? Discrediting anything of value that the former colonial subjects might bring to the table, ceremonially accepting their independence as if independence is granted as a gift by any man when all men are free, as if our independence is hinged on a piece of paper that can be ripped up, hinged on ceremonies. But outside of that, what are we an accepting arrangements which, lock us, which locks us into a particular mold of dependency? and adopting a kind of theology, yes, that makes us into simpletons, that makes us compliant, a level of obeyance on certain rules and laws, whereby that same law is not a shackle. So when I ask the question, what does this mean and how has theology influenced this invention? Theology has influenced this invention because theology was part of the justification for enslaving and discrediting the people who were already here and the people who have inherited the legacy of colonization. Sir? Yes. You said something a while ago that caused my brain to think. Um, <laughs> my brain to go really far, rather. Yes. When, you spoke about, when you spoke about independence, you know, not being something on a piece of paper because every man was made to be free but we find that in the caribbean especially we celebrate independence in such a way like you know it's one of the greatest days um no, known to jamaica and i'm just thinking about it um the fact that listen why should we be celebrating something that we should have we, sh we should have been enjoying we should have had access to you know, um, that is the I, point. I'm looking at I, that is a powerful. I like that you. I love you. No one has ever taken up this point that I've made. I've raised it over and over. I've raised it in this book. It's deep. This book is deep. I'm telling you, it was reviewed as an erudite analysis of Jamaica's economic history. This book was reviewed not by me, by the best. Probably that's why I thought not in Jamaica, as widely in Jamaica. But when I come to Jamaica, I'm coming to launch this book all over the Caribbean and the other one. I made this very important point in this book. I said, why if all if that means no man can give me freedom, then that man is God. <laughs> we, we celebrate a freedom that is hinged on a piece of paper. Oh, we were freed by who? Okay. We were we are already free. No man can be uh, no man can grant another man freedom. Should or should grant another man freedom because if that is the case, then that man will forever still be held in an esteemed position. Because guess what? We got our freedom from the man who can give. But I thought we are all free. I thought we are all independent. No, we celebrate a legacy, a ceremony, okay, of being freed. I mean that we we celebrate being second class. We celebrate the acknowledgement of somebody else's um, determination of our freedom. Because I'm a critical thinker and I think critically about things. That is why Haiti today is experiencing so many problems. That is why Cuba today has so many problems. And countries that took their independence, you notice? The countries that ceremonially got their independence through ceremonies, they are pretty much fine, although they are still, you can never be what you ought to be. Okay? You can never be what you ought to be. I want you to know that. Okay? But I want you to understand this. Okay? I mean, but, become, but once you are baptized into the culture and baptized into the faith, 
then you 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 now gain acceptance into that European identity, but you will still never be you will never be the one and the same. Okay, but you become you become tolerable. But you but I want to make the important point that you notice the difference between Haiti and Cuba. Haiti, Cuba fought and took their independence. So what they have an embargo. Nobody can do business with them. If you do business with them, then US and the big countries will withhold trade and so on and so forth. They took their independence. You, okay, say Haiti. Haiti took their independence. They never have any, have, have any, and that was their problem. That was the issue. Because they took it, I mean, they, they didn't gain it. They took it. Okay? But the thing is, you know, some people can fight for their independence and freedom, but others must not. Who are those? Black people. If black people do it, look what happened. Okay, they, they, they are made an example of Haiti and Cuba. Hmm? Look what happened in, in Grenada. Grenada was going down that route. Grenada with Maurice Bishop in the 1980s. Maurice Bishop in the 1980s and the People's Revolutionary Army. And until they assassinated him, thanks to, thanks to the fact that a group, you know, the same thing they were trying to do in Jamaica when we were going, when in 1974, when Michael Manley announced a period of democratic socialism. But of course, by 1980s, thank, um, with Edward Siaga and his marriage with capitalists, Reaganomics, and so on. Now, by the way, I'm not against Edward Siaga, I'm not against, but the point I'm making is that the way how foreigners, foreign, the foreign masters use strategy to penetrate, but use put up people, develop house slaves within the local, okay? Or, or, the, or, or the local elites. They want to continue their, you know, they said, fine, we will do, we have a little European, a Europe imperialist culture here where some of us are better than the rest to ensure that they continue this kind of strategy of keeping people down, okay? In the, within the Caribbean. Jamaica, people, Jamaica, in a sense, was trying to object to the post-colonial master, to the post-industrial country, through going to populism and so on and so forth. But probably they could have, they could have and would have suffered the same fate as Haiti if they didn't like lap dogs. I apologize, I'm using that strong word, but I like to use strong words to make people feel uncomfortable to understand the gravity of their situation. Take take our independence and and we and accept the kind of the kind of um, constitution that was in the mold of the post-colonial. Even to today, we we can't even trust our own judiciary. Even to today. We can't, we, are, we, were, we are so colonized to think we can't do that. We have to, okay, we can't, up to now, we still look to the, to, 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 to the Lord of England to appeal stuff. The queen is still, or the king is still our head of state. But the point I'm making is those who gain, who get, who took their independence are forever struggling. But those who get gained it, or took, accepted it, or got it as a gift, as a gift. <laughs> so, yes, those who got it as a gift. My freedom and independence is, is okay, is not dependent and hinged on any gift. I am a man, I'm a human being. I am free like anybody else. But you are made, and okay, but that's fine, we are okay with you. But do like what Maurice Bishop tried to do and you will be affected. Do like what Haiti did. Do like what Cuba did or Venezuela. Yes? But when we talk about theology, theology has also served to, prop, to create the invention. Because they were coming under the auspices of their Christian religion, of the Roman Catholic Church. And some people don't really understand, uh, you know, when people study church, they don't really understand Roman Catholic. Roman Catholic Church is not a different religion 
all churches that we have today comes from the Roman Catholic tradition. And many, okay, and, and from the Roman Catholic tradition, you have, a, you have the Protestantism after the Reformation. That's where you have the Protestantism, Protestant church started. The first one was Anglican. Okay. After the church break away from Roman Catholicism because, it, because of the injustices of the church, the priests were selling indulgences. The power of the Roman Catholic Church today stems from the Dark Ages, stems from corruption, bureaucracy that is built into a system to serve that to serve as a to privilege others. That's the same, okay, and develop the and the church and the church fathers came from that tradition and the Bible that we have today came from that tradition, a tradition that has been steeped in corruption and injustice, okay? That gave the, the, the Christianity that Jesus started a Roman identity and a bureaucracy that promotes privilege, status, and position. So while the church broke away from Roman Catholicism, the origin, okay, broke away all, but it did, okay, you have Christianity of Jesus, and then after that, you have the Christianity that was morphed by the early church fathers in order because of, they wanted to win the competition of the day and wanted to give the church this Roman identity and, and, and the Caesars. Capitalize on that. Say, hey, I can, the way I can win, the way I can get the greatest support and lead this great expansion into Europe and the world is by getting, um, is by ad finding support from this Christianity and then there was a marriage between the church and the state and so on and the church became a big institution with, and, and alongside that was the development of scriptures within a certain way that gave rise to the institution and the canon. And when the church break away from the Roman Catholic Church after the dark, after the dark ages and enlightenment and so on and so forth, it took a long time because the church people, this is how people were saying, oh, all these new church today, excuse me, the Roman Catholic can't say the same thing about you guys because they thought they had the right church, okay? Actually, when I hear people talk, people don't think clearly about things. People don't think widely about things. Because the original was Roman Catholic, but today people look down on the Roman Catholic. They, even in Jamaica, some people think the Roman Catholic are a different religion. No, but they are the original, actually. In fact, Anglicanism stemmed from that. So we started with the Anglican, which were the first Protestants. And then you have another breakaway, breakaway, breakaway. To the point that then you get the evangelicals and the charismatics and the Pentecostals, oneness or triuneness, so on and so forth. Okay, but when, but still, we, although there was a breakaway, they still accept, they still broke away, but still kept the scriptures. They broke away, but they, from Roman Catholicism, but they still accepted the canon of scripture that Roman. Okay, but they took out certain parts after they broke away from the Catholic Church. Excuse me. They took out certain parts, the apocryphal books. And the more you go on and 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 on. When you understand the history of all things and appropriate it properly, then you are careful, okay, about the determination you make about yourself and about what you hold on to and about what you believe and the exclusivity of things. Anyway, we don't want to delve into that. Um, then we get to question, um, uh, where are we now? But we are going through the, um, the syllabus. And to two questions from section 2B, what does Bob Marley say? Oh, we said that. Um, so what does, oh, what does Bob Marley mean by we're not Mar capitalist or Marxists, we Rastas in the film Who Shot the Sheriff? I love that. What does Bob Marley mean? We're not capitalists or Marxists. Okay? We, so in, he, he, Bob Marley doesn't look to a political way out or escape. I remember we talk about the Depression years. He does not look to... Uh, but he looked to a religious way out. Rastafari. He's not going to look to Marxism. 
He's not going to look to capitalism or a political way out. He's going to find he, he, his solution is through his own religion, a religion of the Rasta. Okay. And if you um, read the notes from the previous class about that, I, I mentioned that. Okay. A religion of the Rasta, away from Eurocentrism. He rejects British colonialism. That involves, that involves the very books that they bring. Okay, you cannot, you, you can't come to me with no religion. You can't come to me after, with, after you have abused me and my people. So the Rastas, they look to another way out. And this, what is Pokomania? And state what other Afro-Caribbean religion goes by the name and or has incorporated Poko in their traditions and practices. What's the answer for that, if I ask you that? Number two, um, and you're supposed to answer two questions from this section. One, so, so question two says, what is Pokomania? And state what other Afro-Caribbean religion goes by that name. By the way, if you are doing the research, if you are a researcher, then you would know that because I sent you the document with the rationale and in it, the study notes, I define Pokomania. Okay, so you guys can get the answer from that. But of course, and you also know, I also mentioned it, what other... Um, Afro-Caribbean religion. What if anybody jump? Tell me the answer. Um, Pokomania is practiced by what other Afro-Caribbean religion? Anybody? Repeat that question, sir. Another. What other Afro-Caribbean religion goes by the name? Or has incorporated Poko in their traditions and practices. No, no, no. Wouldn't that be revivalism? Revivalism, sir. Yes, revivalism. yes, yes. All right. Okay, there we go. You guys got the answer. Yeah, man, yeah, man. All right. I like that. Briefly describe what is Rastafarianism and state in what year and what historical event did Rastafarianism emerge? Of course, right? Okay, if I ask you that, can you get that? You don't have to tell me what it is. Okay, but of course, it's a religious system but it's not just a religious system a religion a political system that started as a response or in response to um to colonialism and to and to you you were centrism okay um if i were to ask you what year did it emerge what year did rastafarianism emerge anybody based on the last class what year and what historical event 1900 the Okay, that's it. That's that's good. Nineteen hundred, but what exact year? And in what historical event did Rastafarianism emerge? We may, I mentioned that in the last class, and it's also on the notes on Afro Caribbean. The rational study at the bottom, the study notes is there. I said that in what year Rastafarianism? Nineteen thirty, so correct. Nineteen thirties, and we know what happened in the nineteen thirties. They. What, what happened in the 1930s? The Great Depression, right? So when you yeah. answer this question, I'm looking for that, for those, especially those okay. two things. What year, 1930s? And, in what his, and what historical event? The Great Depression, all right? The Great Depression. But you're only to answer two. Now, the question is, how did Obia begin in Jamaica? How did Obia begin in Jamaica? What peoples and or person is said to have influenced it and state one aspect of the practice? Would it be West African, sir? Okay, the Ash more, more specifically, the Ashanti people. Yeah, no, 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 the Ashanti no. people or a person. What other, okay, give me a person, a name. That same gentleman that went to Haiti, sir, that um, started voodoo. I can't remember his name right now. Good, good, good. That's fine. But once you're on the right track, so once you take this exam and review it, you'll get it. Dotty Bookman, okay? Dotty yeah, Bookman. Bookman. Yeah, man. Dotty Bookman. My name is Dotty Bookman. <laughs> Dotty Bookman. And him come from Jamaica, you know. I mean, Jamaicans were large. Boy, we're big in a history. When you read to study history, Okay, big we are. I mean, but by the way, but Dr. Bookman came from Senegal. Okay, Senegal. So West African Ghana, but we I think, but I think it's not just Ghana. 
I think they are also, we had some kind of Africans that came from Senegal, okay? And, but although there was a split between Ghana and Senegal, but Senegal, but, um, but there was some, and by the way, Bookman was a big strapping man, very educated, and he could read the Quran. And, you know, CLR James said that it's quite interesting, like the people that came to the Caribbean on slave ships, they must have been very intelligent. They must have been princes and queens and powerful people because they, they, they quickly adapted. Because first of all, one, they were, to be able to travel the Middle Passage to the Caribbean, it took, a, you had to be a lot, you had to have, you, you have to have a very good health, okay? Very good physique. And then you come there and then you, not only that, you said you are versed in the Quran and you started voodoo and then you went to Haiti and, 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 and started, uh, sorry, when Jamaica started, Obia didn't finish it really, went to Haiti and started Haitian voodoo. And then when you started Haitian voodoo, of course you helped to, 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 to start a whole, now he, a whole generation, a whole culture, that eventually led to to Saint who fought the British and won. I mean, sorry, the French and won. And I'm like, CLR James said, they must be intelligent. There must have been some princes and priests, very important people that came, the people that came to the Caribbean from Africa, they must have been very brilliant. The fact that they were able to learn the techniques of sugar plantation, you know what I mean? They must, so, you know, I went, the Europeans, but the people that they brought to the Caribbean, you know, that they got that they got from the from Africa, that they, they want the pian pian people, the dippy dippy people. My father was a pian pian. Okay, they wanted people who were of a particular physique, of a particular intellectual level, because of what they were trying to do with the Caribbean, and they had to be able to have very healthy. So if you're not healthy, if you're not strong, if you are not technical and so on you can't come it's even you look to today what happened they get the best and the brightest you have to have ties to come to certain first first world countries okay and and they have a program now if you have a phd or if you have um advanced graduate studies it's easier for you and you come from another country and you've been here for a little bit and it's easier for you to become a citizen or to be to be get per, to get permanency okay easier my permanency was quicker, it was like pop, pop, pop. And then I, I'm a citizen now, but it was so, I mean, it was so fast. Then no one, oh, what? This guy, okay, yeah, we want him. Okay. <laughs> they want the best and the brightest. And so you look, the, so you look at the kind of people that came to the Caribbean. They were brilliant people, they were skilled, yet still they were discredited. Oh, they're savages. But, you know, it was quite paradoxical. Okay, they want the best. But, okay, they want the best and the brightest to do what they were about to do. But at the same time, to justify, to make themselves feel good because they have a religion of love. So in order for them to justify why they were enslaving a whole set of people and treating them like dogs and savages, they had, and they had to come up with an argument that justifies their religion of love to make them, because now you have a religion of love. How are you able to enslave a whole set of people and treat them like savages? What kind of Christianity, what kind of missions? And then you say you're going to bring, you're going to bring gold and Christianity to these people? Wow. So then you bring, so then you look for a, a theory on the back shelves that speak to race. So, oh, see, develop a, a theory of race. That says, oh, some people are better than others. And say, oh, they don't have religion. They're savages. They are close to the devil. You redefine people to control them. Oh, no, they're not good people. They don't have religion. They don't have nothing, okay? So I'm telling you, when you begin to really delve into this, to study, to study these things, then you, then, then you begin to wonder. Then you begin to ask yourself more questions, okay? Then you'll be okay. That's that's where we are now. So Obia was said to have started by um Dottie Bookman. Now the next question, answer one question. Ronaldo McKenzie's analysis 
about the Caribbean today is the preface, in the preface of the book Neoliberalism suggests what is ironic about the Caribbean as a paradise. Um, what is the irony? And do you agree with his premise and argument about the Caribbean? Justify your position in relation to his statement on the negative experience of contrast. By the way, now that question, all of the section, quest, um, section 2C, if, if you were to read it, then you would say, what does this have to do with Caribbean theology? This requires Caribbean thought. Caribbean thought is a part of Caribbean theology. Carib you, I mean, I, you ask this question, the question requires it, needs a, the a theological response that is Caribbean. That's it. So they're like, oh, so Ronaldo McKenzie in this book, um, you know, not this book, sorry. In this book, and by the way, this book is available on the Audible. If you go to the Audible, you can, it's, I think if you have an Audible account, it's free, zero dollars. Or you can get the ebook. But there's a look inside feature. If you go to Amazon and bring up my book, there is a look inside feature that gives you free access to the preface of the book. And in the preface of the book, I lay out my hypothesis. So you want to, okay? Ronaldo McKenzie's analysis about the Caribbean today in the preface of the book, Neoliberalism, suggests what is ironic about the Caribbean as a paradise? What is the irony? And do you agree with this premise and argument about the Caribbean? Okay, the irony, we're talking about opposites. We're talking about irony, the opposites. Okay, say for example, we're talking about dramatic irony. You're watching a movie. Okay, one of the put one of the characters in the movie in the film in one of the scenes you're watching you're watching it you are the character is one of the characters is about to go into the room the next room the next room that's where the killer is they're watching a killer movie the killer is in the next room you know that the killer is in the next room but the the character on the screen the screen doesn't know that okay and you're like oh my god oh my god oh no 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 no, no. don't go in that room the killer is in that room Oh, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Dramatic irony. That's what it is. That's dramatic, dramatic irony. That's an irony. You talk about irony. Say, for example, in the um in this book, Wretched of the Earth by Franz Fanon. Everybody must get this book too. Wretched of the Earth, Franz Fanon. Listen to this. Homi Baba is writing in the preface of this book about. Franz Fanon and the Bandung Conference. Write that down. You won't, I won't ask you that question in the exam, but for your own edification, the Bandung Conference. Not many Jamaicans know what the Bandung Conference is. But when you, if you are a student of Pan Africanism, a student of post colonialism, a student of liberation theology or Black liberation theology, and the independence movement, and understand. Part of what happened in 1962 and that drive started somewhere in the beginning. Okay, there was a Bandon conference. This is in 1944. All the most powerful countries, the the, 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 the post-colonial industrial countries, westernized, the, the dominant countries in the West, all met, came together and started the United Nations. Third world or devel sorry, developing countries or colonial countries, colonized countries, they weren't present. Okay, they created a world within their mode that many of us don't know what some of what was discussed. Globalization was discussed, I'm quite sure. This move towards this independence was discussed, but they were already planning to grant people independence. But they came together to work out a mold in the world to work out the details of this independence. They said, This is okay, fine, these people want independence, we're going to give it to them. But this is how it's going to happen. We're going to still maintain our, our dominance. But it's going to be good for us. Okay, we're going to create the United Nations with certain rules, blah, 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 so on and so forth. Fast forward to 1955, former colonial countries and so on. They said, okay, we're going to have, a, have, a, have our own country, our own conference, the Bandung Conference, the Bandung Conference. Okay, and in the Bandung Conference, they talk about it. I'm so sorry. I'm going to pause. My, um, I apologize for that. Uh, let me stop this for a second.
I'm sorry about that. Anyways, I don't have much time to get into it too much, but to the, the Bandung Conference, they all came together. And that's one of the things I critique, criticize the Caribbean people about, the loss of solidarity. Because we talk about the Caribbean Federation. There was, at one time, we were talking about the Caribbean being a federation between, in 1950s. But then all of a sudden, the nationalists took over and said, no, they want their own countries. And they said, no, we want to have our own independence. We wanted to strut our own, um, play our own tune in Jamaica, play our own tune in Barbados, play our own tune in Trinidad. That, but little did they know what was coming in the 1970s. While they are at the Bandung Conference, while they are um, planning in the 1950s toward planning, talking about independence and nationalism and so on, becoming nation states, self-determined, yes? Sovereign nation, independent states. By, okay, and then we're talking about um, the, the liberation revolution was going on, the Algerian revolution and so on and so forth. Fine, they got independence. But little did these nationalists know what was happening, what was going to happen in the, to, uh, the 1970s and, this, and so on and so, 80s and so on with globalization? That's the irony. That's irony. That's irony. It must seem ironic, even absurd at first. It must seem ironic, even absurd, to search for association and intersection between colonization and globalization because, okay, Parallels would be pushing the analogy. When decolonization, when decolonization had the dream of what? Decolonization is to, to, to decolonize is to what? Is to become independent. Independent, okay. yeah. Right. Is to is the process of 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 of, of re retaking your control. The, so coloni to colonize is to control. To decolonize is to get to throw off control, control from without. Yes. So you have control from without and control from within. Decolonization is a process of control from without. From, so, I mean, sorry, it's throwing off control from without. It's to, to jettison. To jettison is to get rid of. Okay. Control from without. From control outside of yourself. While colonization is control from within. Okay. Or, so, sorry, um, it's control from within. So control from without and within. You have those. So you you are either you are you either control yourselves or you either controlled by others. So decolonization was a process where they were getting rid of this control that is outside of themselves. Okay. So now here it is that we are saying that it is ironic that all these um, former colonized countries had this dream of a a dream decolonization had this dream of a third world of free post-colonial nations firmly on its horizon whereas globalization gazes at the nation through the back mirror as it speaks towards the strategic denationalization de of state sovereignty so globalization in a sense have to do with the denationalization of state sovereignty we talk about structural adjustment was to liberalize economies to open up e economies, to get rid of barriers. Globalization is the crisscrossing of goods and services. So you want to get rid of barriers, while at the same time, at the Bandon Conference and these colonial countries, I'm sorry, former colonized countries at the time in, was dreaming about, oh, their own independent nations. All of a sudden, little did they know what was going to happen in the next five or 10 years. OPEC and globalization, which means which was the opposite of their dream. So that, okay, that's irony. So in the book, I begin, in this book, I said, I said, uh, when we hear of Jamaica and the Caribbean, we think of, we think of beautiful islands of paradise with sun, sea, and sand, reggae music, cannabis, and Irish people like you, St. Bolt, People who are living out their best, who are living out their best dreams and lives. But this book analyzes this motif. Motif is prevailing idea. Analyzes this motif. Given the historical and current economic and political situation in Jamaica, 
and the Caribbean, and so on and so forth. And you can read on. Okay. But I'm going to get back to that in a second. The second question said, based on your reading on Walter Rodney, how similar is the history of Guyana's fight for independence and national sovereignty to that of Haiti today? Again, based on the reading on Walter Rodney, how similar is the history of Guyana, Guyana's fight for independence and national freedom to that of Haiti today? Now, I don't think, you, if you guys did Caribbean Thought, you may have seen Walter Rodney. But maybe when you did um, Caribbean Thought, I never taught the course, so you would not have... It wasn't heavy on Caribbean stuff. So you may not have seen Walter Rodney. But Walter Rodney is very important, a very important figure in Caribbean Thought, okay? And Caribbean development, especially in Guyana. And he was assassinated by his own people, just like Maurice Bishop in the 1980 guy Walter Rodney by the way if you go on my twitter page i answer that i ask this question and i answer it okay if you know what happened with the whole situation with guyana and what with haiti haiti today that have that is being supported by the us okay haiti that's supporting a illegitimate de facto prime minister who is slowly developing a dictatorship while in Guyana in the 1980s, that's exactly what happened with the Burham government. Jimmy Carter and the U.S. government were supporting the Burham dictatorship. Okay? Walter Rodney fought, fought against that. Okay? And it's the same thing that's happening, happening today, where Haiti is, where a particular, they are benefiting, Ariel Henry is benefiting from the U.S. while he developed his dictatorship as a de facto by the way, the Europeans is said to have traveled to the European, to, to the Caribbean for two reasons. One was for gold, state the other reason, and briefly explain their, not yours, their justification for reason two. Again, the Europeans is said to have traveled to the Caribbean for two reasons. One was for gold. What, what's the other reason? Proselyting, sir. Yes. Yes, definitely. That was the other reason. To make Christians. disciples out of, right, out of, of yes, Christians. There was Christ, they went to Christianize the savages. They went to Christianize the savages who had no God, who had no who had no religion, no proper tongue, who were unsophisticated, who were next to the devil and Satan. Yes, ethnocentrism, we call that. It, the reason was full of and ethnocentrism and guess what and then when they were finished with their project they have made even us suspicious of our own religion and our own tongue and our own ancestry we even laugh and look down upon our own practices because we have guess what it was a successful project by europeans when you have a when you can look down on your own histories when you can laugh at your own traditions and find it weird and outlandish Yes, the project was successful. The project was successful. They did a project on us. <laughs> they did. They did a project on us. And we have ran with it. Anyways, so let us look at a more sophisticated response. Let's look at a more sophisticated response. Now, On the issue of Rastafarianism, Rastafarianism, and by Rastafarianism emerged in the 1930s, we say in Jamaica, it is a religious and cultural movement that emphasizes the divinity of He Selassie, the first, the former emperor of Ethiopia, whom Rastafarians believe to be the incarnation of God, Jah. The movement gained popularity due to its resistance against what? Colonialism and racial discrimination. Rastafari could not say, how could I accept a religion and a gospel that, was, that racially discriminates against my own color, my own people? It just didn't make sense to them. 
Rastafarianism serves as a symbol of resistance and empowerment for marginalized Afro-Caribbean communities, fostering strong sense of identity and cultural pride. Now in section three, I asked, you just need to do one question from section three, one question, I'm gonna do one for you. Should theology transcend culture? Discuss. The question of whether theology should transcend culture is complex and multifaceted. By the way, I've answered this question before. If you go to um, if you go to the neoliberal.com or renaldocmackenzie.com. By the way, if, did you guys visit my website, the neoliberal.com, renaldocmackenzie.com? It's beautiful. By the way, subscribe to the journal, subscribe to the post. You can also go to the YouTube feed and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Whenever we get a, a new YouTube post, podcast or video is done, you will get notified. And of course, we're on iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, so on and so forth. But um, there is a whole presentation on should theology transcend culture, three hour presentation, but this is a summary of it. And then I have a summary within a summary. Okay, but this is the presentation. If you were to write this for the exam, this is all I need. Three paragraphs would be this. The question of whether theology should transcend culture is complex and multifaceted. On one hand, on one hand, Theology aims to explore universal questions about the divine and human existence, which could suggest that it, it should transcend cultural boundaries to uncover truths applicable to all humanity. Again, the question of whether theology should transcend culture and to transcend is to go beyond culture is complex and multifaceted, involving a lot of component parts. On one hand, theology aims to do what? To explore universal questions about the divine and human existence. Theology aims to explore what? Universal questions about the divine and human existence. Theology aims to explore universal, uh, universal questions about the divine and human existence. That's theology in general, but, uh, but Caribbean theology, Caribbean theology questions or is aimed at recapturing and recovering a particular culture that eschews Eurocentric ideology that is that claims to be superior to a particular culture and a particular people. Which could suggest that it should transcend cultural boundaries. So so in one sense. If theology aims to explore universal questions about the divine and human existence, which suggests that it, it should transcend cultural boundaries to uncover truths applicable to all humanity, there is always a but. It is essential to recover that theology. So, okay, yes, we could argue yes. If the aim of theology is to explore universal questions about the divine, and human existence, then yes, it should transcend cultural boundaries and it should uncover truths applicable to all humanity. However, it is essential, it is essential to recognize that theology is shaped by human perspectives and experiences inherently making it culturally influenced. Oh my God, that's deep. Let's let that settle in. So while it should transcend culture, to uncover truth applicable to all humanity, mm -hmm. because, because theology is about 
universal questions about the divine and human existence. At the same time, we learn that history is a result of the varieties of human natures and circumstances. And of course, we learn about critical thinking in Caribbean thought, where we learn that Kohito Iegusum, I think, therefore I am. When you try to discover your own existence by denying your own, by denying the truth of all things, you can't deny one thing, which is the mind, which is your mind. So the only thing you can be sure of is your mind. So, okay, bearing, so it is essential then to recognize that theology, although it we try to claim for a universality of this God, is shaped by human perspectives and experiences which is inherently making it culturally influenced but what men have tried to do as i said in the last class is to okay is to strut their own egos and we talk about the franchisement the franchisement of the gospel or this, the competitive nature of humanity or the selfishness of humanity no matter as much as we claim to be unselfish, as much as we claim objectivity, as much as we claim that, and I'm telling you, there is no denying it. Our perspective is shaped by our human experiences. Transcending culture entirely would risk imposing one particular cultural interpretation as the norm. Again, if when you ask the question, should theology transcend culture? No, okay, moving beyond that, let's get to the second point. Should theology transcend culture? Transcending culture entirely would risk doing what? Transcending culture. Go, if theology should transcend culture, if you transcend culture, transcend culture entirely, it would risk imposing a particular cultural interpretation as the norm. Because if we say, yes, it transcends culture, but we agree that theology is shaped by human perspective and experiences, inherently making it cultural. So if, it, if we say it's, if, but if we say it should transcend culture and the religion and the theology you have is that of, that is beyond culture, you are running the risk of imposing a particular cultural interpretation as the norm. You are, uni you are universalizing your particular theology as the norm. As the norm. Neglecting the richness and diversity of other cultural experiences and expressions of faith. I don't, you know, this is the climactic aspect of this class. I'm happy I'm recording it. This is the climactic aspect of this class. Somebody, I was supposed to teach Christianity today in, at JTS or contemporary, and, they, and some people had a problem with me teaching the course. They said, oh, you're going to radicalize the students. You're going to radicalize the students. No, no, no. Ronaldo, you can't teach the course. And some, Go ahead. They said, they said, I'm going to radicalize the course. And then I eventually withdraw. I said, you know what? I'm not going to fight with anyone. I don't have to teach the course. I was so busy anyways. I said, contemporary. Oh, I'm not teaching. That's fine. I'm not teaching the course. But my job is not to radicalize. My job is to provide as a responsible educator is to provide you with the information for you to make up your mind. So I'm going to bring it to you. This is Caribbean theology. I will not make it Eurocentric. Okay? I will sir, not make sir, it. Sir, sir, Go ahead. You owe both myself and Karen an extra grade. 5%, sir. I... For what? What happened? You guys went offline just now. So we need five percent agreed, sir. What happened? You hearing me, sir? For what? I overheard you say that I am happy that I recorded this class. That's what you said, sir. 
Oh and yes, saying, yeah. Oh, oh yes, yes, yes. Okay, fine, I fine. Saying, I agree. I agree. And myself influence that decision. So we need five percent. Right? All right, you, you get five percent as well. Okay, <laughs> that's good. I'm happy I'm recording because this is powerful. This is a powerful message. This is a powerful message. And I'm okay, a powerful message to everybody all over the world and in Jamaica and the Caribbean. And you know, so, I so sir, in this case, eh, every culture should define theology based on their culture and uh, should have their own theology. But, or should should every culture should have its own theology or definition of theology? I mean, we said we already said that. I mean. If you have to study cultures today, every culture, they have their own religion. They have, in fact, the Europeans, they brought their culture and they brought their religion and religion that was based on their culture. The Africans, we already had our religion. But the thing is, they, when they came, they rejected our culture and our religion as second to theirs. If you study culture, which is the way of life of its people, okay, it, it says even if you study Jesus and the way when he taught and the way how he preached to different peoples, even Jesus, the Jews had their religion, which was culture. The Gentiles, Jesus introduced to them a new religion for them to run with. Yes, but I mean the question. This is imp but to. Okay, but to have a theology that is cultural, does it take away from the universality of God? It goes to show that there is God, but God is bigger than culture. But the way we understand this God is based on our human perspective. Now, if I, okay, fine, you know, I think what the problem is. What is wrong if we have an understanding of God that is cultural? What is wrong? With, that's the question then. That is the actual question. What is wrong with that? We can't see a God that creates cultures and speaks to us in those cultures. No, but as I said, Muta Baruka said, God is human creation, <laughs> you know? But no, what men, but what we are doing, because of colonization, we're doing the same thing that Europeans are doing and what other people are doing. We talk, I'm writing a book on privilege, power, and position. From the very foundation of, I'm writing a book and my study at Georgetown is entitled, The Foundation of Knowledge, and the hegemony of faith. Listen again. The foundations of knowledge and the hegemony of faith. The foundations of knowledge and the hegemony of faith. I'm saying to you, throughout history, men have demonstrated their ethnocentrism. Men have imposed their cultures. And part of that imposition is their religion and everything else. You know, in other words, they, they, in order to justify the Roman, Roman, Roman culture as the best culture, human beings have a tendency of also marrying it with their religion. It's as if we are competing for the best cultures in addition to the best religious values. Because the kind of religion that was sold to us is the religion of the Europeans. It was cultural. But the question is, okay, fine, but is something wrong with 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 an understanding of God that is contextual, it's something. It doesn't matter because we are still seeing God. But please remember that we are limited human beings. The the the, the thing is this. I ask the question: If is it wrong? Is it wrong to see God as to have a cultural understanding of God? Understand? Okay. And the second thing is, God. We are limited, but God is unlimited. We will get it wrong, but God will not. But it doesn't matter. Every culture that regards God or have a theology of God demonstrates their appreciation for the divine, for something beyond them. And they relate to that God based on how they believe God has come down to them. And I was making that point some time ago. God is so smart. He's much, his intelligence is beyond me. We guys, okay, we call ourselves academics. And we talk about being, um, we talk about we are academics. But our academics come from the divine. 
This is how he can make things academic. And he God can speak to us in culture. God can God can speak to us in tongues. This is how he speaks to you in English. He speaks to you in Haitian. So because you speak a Haitian, you speak to God in Haitian, does it make your language to God better than mine? That, in effect, that is what people are saying when you look at it deeply. You call God Jehovah, another one call him Allah. And the way how you relate to that God is based on a particular experiences that you've had and the way in which God has come and the way God is so great. God has created all these various cultures and then intervened in these cultures in certain ways so that these people relate to God and talk about God based on the experiences that they have. It is like when you speak about God and experience God, it's like, it's like language. People have different languages. So the language for God is different depending on the language you speak, depending on the country you live in. But when you, but the point, okay, what is important is this. It is to recognize our limitations and to recognize that we don't have all of it. It is to recognize our limitation. So I said, okay, fine. What? Okay, we said trans. What? What is transcending the idea of God? What is transcending the I, the ultimate in every religion that speaks about God? God is the one thing, though. He is than that which nothing greater can be conceived. He is omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient. Fine. Now, how are we to relate to that God? And how does He act? No, that's a different issue. The systems we create to make, okay, to make God, the systems we create in our cultures is the, is the system that people create to relate to that God. To know people create systems now, systematic theology. People create systems to relate to that universal God. So, okay, fine. So God, so I could say, fine. Of course, God can the idea of God in terms of the God, the divine, the ultimate God, but in terms of in terms of how we relate to that God and how that God finds expression within our own poles is different. So the way if God showed up and talked with you today and told me, so he did, he showed up, I'm like, no, that's not God, that's devil. Now what am I doing? I'm privileging my idea and understanding of God over yours. Because that's, we have, that's human selfishness. That's human drive. And sometimes I wonder if that is Satan. That, that is, you ever thought about that? No, I thought, I, I think widely. When we try to puff up our own ideas over others, is that the, is that the work of Satan? Is that the work of the devil? Is that, is that the kind of division that the devil wants of all things? Transcending culture would risk imposing one particular cultural interpretation as the norm. Transcending culture entirely would risk imposing one particular cultural interpretation as the norm. Do you understand what I'm making, Williams and Howard and Chantel? Oh, sure, sure, sir. Sure, sure. I am here. Right. So, listen carefully. Powerful point I'm making. What is powerful? What is powerful, you say, is that God remains the same, omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient. God doesn't Come change. On. He does not. That point. Yeah, so it depends on the culture. And Allah, or in, in Creole, how do I understand God in English? But how, somebody in how Dutch, we relate, in Dutch, there we go, but English. how we relate to that God. I, I get you, I get you. And how God in relates to us is a different issue. But what, what we have done is that we have confused this un, this. General, this God that is omnipresent and blah blah, with a, with our cultural relating of this God. So, trans so transcending culture entirely would risk transcending culture. If we were to transcend culture entirely, we would risk imposing one particular cultural interpretation as the norm, neglecting the richness and diversity of other cultural expressions of faith such such and such an approach could perpetrate 
Eurocentrism. Eurocentrism. If we were to transcend, if we were transcending a cultural, transcending cultural entirety, entirely, transcending culture entirely would risk imposing a particular cultural interpretation as the norm, as the standard, neglecting the richness and diversity of other cultural expressions of faith, such as, and such an approach could perpetuate what? The same thing that Caribbean theology is against, Eurocentrism, colonialism, cultural hegemony, silencing marginalized voices and beliefs from different cultures. A more inclusive in, um, perspective, a more inclusive perspective, a more inclusive perspective acknowledges that theology can engage with diverse cultural contexts, learning from different worldviews and incorporating local beliefs and practices. By doing so, theology becomes enriched and adapted, uh, adaptable, sorry. It becomes enriched and adaptable or adjustable to different cultural realities, fostering a more inclusive and respectful approach. So for Caribbean theology, transcending culture does not mean negating its roots or cultural identity. Again, for Caribbean theology, transcending culture does not mean negating its roots or cultural identity, but rather engaging in a critical dialogue that draws from its cultural heritage while also addressing the challenges and opportunities of the present. So this approach empowers Caribbean communities to reclaim their narratives, interpret scriptures through their context, and construct theology that resonates with their lived experiences. It also encourages a more meaningful and relevant engagement with spiritual and religious practices, enabling a greater sense of ownership and connection to faith. Ultimately, a dynamic and open-minded theology that recognizes the importance of culture can contribute to the spiritual well-being and empowerment of Caribbean communities. And by the way, that, that, and that's it. That's the end. And I know I went off on a tangent. And that's, that's, the, that's, that's it. And I know I asked some more questions for you guys to answer, but I'm just going to answer. I'm going to leave you guys with that one. And, you can, and there are other questions. Say, for example, how does Paul Tillich define God? And does it hold true for Caribbean today? Um, Paul Tillich says that God is man's ultimate concern. God is man's ultimate concern. But question one speaks to question two, just so you know. Muta Baruka said that God is a human creation. What does he mean by that? And explain whether you agree or disagree with this statement. Okay? That's a powerful one. And, and if you were, at question one, in a sense, speaks to question three. How does Rastafarianism justify their new religion over Christianity? How do they justify their new religion over Christianity? Okay? And we talk about this issue of Eurocentrism, yes? This Eurocentrism and Babylon, Babylonia or Babylon. And question five, what attitude do Jamaicans have towards Afro-Caribbean beliefs? And what has influenced these positions? What attitude do Jamaicans have towards Afro-Caribbean beliefs? Now, many of you may not be able to answer that question, or you may be able to answer it. You can, you can speak from your own experiences. That one is more anthropological and ethnographic. Okay. What are, you, what are your attitudes towards Jamaican? What attitudes have you always had towards Afro-Caribbean beliefs? But to answer that question, you have to define Afro-Caribbean beliefs. Okay. And, um, and, Afro, and we already defined Afro-Caribbean beliefs already. Those emanating from the experience of slavery, from Africa and the experience of slavery. Okay. And you can point to Obia, Haitian voodoo, Jamaican revivalism, and Rastafarianism. Okay. Now, what were, I mean, growing up as a child, I, I was told that Rastas were nasty. Don't go near them. Okay. I was told that Jamaican revivalists and Poco and voodoo, they were devilish, satanic. And if you see a, a house that 
is that look like a revivalist um, kind of a tradition. You walk far from it, Guppy will catch you. Okay, you are, you look down on, on on that experiences. Okay, and of course you could make that we are doing a study on this very same thing thing. All right, but what has happened is that you know more exposure to HBO to this Me Too movement, inclusivity, so on and so forth. Now and not only that, with the with you no know, critical thinking and now now Caribbean people now we are doing our own theology. We're doing our own thinking. We're not just draw, we're not, and we're writing our own books. And we are reading the archives now to learn more about history. So now we are learning more about all things. And now we are learning. We have been, and you know, one time, you know, when you come to the U.S., let's talk about cosmopolitanism. Cosmopolitan. A Jamaican man comes to the U.S. or anywhere in the, to the post-colonial world and then goes back. Oh, he's too exposed. If you come back with a little earring and stuff, it's too, or with a tattoo. Oh, in turn America now. In America now, yes, they look down on you. You know, the same colonial colonization has, it has done its job. The project on us has been successful. So that if someone come and is more, you know, they don't want, your own countrymen don't want you to be aware and exposed to knowledge. Your own countrymen. Guess what? That was the strategy to prevent your, your own awareness and to let your own people facilitate this. Your own people, our own people, that was the strategy to prevent any movement in the right direction. We look down, okay, so when you go away and you do your little studies and you are exposed, in fact, in some churches, they don't want you to have a theological education in some churches. They don't, don't, they don't want you to have a theological education. They don't want you to be too exposed. Why? It's a strategy that was always the case. You can't go outside and read other people's Bible, like in some denominations today, some church religions and some churches that are considered to be cultic, okay? Some churches are considered to be cultic, a cult of Christianity. They're considered, okay, they don't want you to read other books. Why? And when you look at that, that is how people are controlled. It is an issue of control that is coming from colonization and the selfishness and the, e the ego and the superego. But what God do we serve? If we look at God really well, you don't serve man, you serve God. It is God that is the end all, not man, not my pastor, not my priest. <laughs> you work out your own salvation and then guess what? God will intervene. If you limit God to only what one man says, then you have a problem. Because if God is bigger than men, don't you serve a God that can speak to you in your own local in a particular way? I say, okay, fine. Yes, he speaks to you, but you have to rely on somebody other than you to interpret. <laughs> okay. But anyway, we stop right there. The strategy, when you start to study power, and I study power, by the way, that's one of the subjects I study. I study power, okay? I study privilege, and I'm studying, I study the, the archives and stuff. I go deep into history. I don't, I, I'm studying history. I am telling you that, and boy, am I learning. Boy, am, am I being exposed to stuff. Woo! When you start to read these things, then you understand some things. I am able to teach the way I teach because I have an open mind and I read everything. I am talking to you as a very conservative person coming from Jamaica, okay, that started this drive to understand things and understand them properly, okay? And as an adult, as a human being, we talk about no man give me my freedom. I'm a man, so I must be free. We are all free. We are freed men, okay? We are all freed. My freedom doesn't, I, it doesn't take another, a, a, a white man to, give, to make me free. Mm -mm. That means he's God. You are free to do what? To make sense of your own world. And, and because God has given you intelligence as a human being. But human beings have corrupted that freedom because they want control for themselves.
Life is about people and how people relate. Life is about people and how people relate. Yet we say life is what you make it. And there are those who have, and, and there are those who have made it and justified the make through dynamics that colors the way we relate with each other and has created the black position in the world. And that's the end. The end. By the way, the question is, the end is just the beginning. The end is just the beginning. I added that last part. The end is just the beginning. The end is just the beginning. The end. Oh, need the quiz again? Sorry? Hear it again? When you need the quiz again, remind us. When you need the quiz again, remind us, please. Um, you, have, you can send it to me by Saturday, Friday, Saturday. No, today's Thursday, so no. And your exam is Tuesday, so that's good. So you can send it to me on Sunday. The Caribbean Thought class have to send me theirs on Sunday. Sunday. Okay, thank your, you. Yeah, you can send me yours on Sunday, and then I will review it and um, and see how you guys did. Okay? Um, some of the answers okay. don't belong. Just so you know, the answers don't have to belong. Um, this, uh, this particular, when you submit it, I will mark it, and then when, when I mark it, I will respond by submitting with submitting another paper where I did it and my answers are on there. And you can interact with that as well. But you do it first, and I want to see what you have, okay? But I've done the exam already, okay? Those were my answers. They were a little bit long how I said it, but I was going off paper as well. <laughs> so um, that's about it, guys. Thank you so much for making this class an amazing class. And I will keep this group, the, the, I will keep the WhatsApp group. So keep, keep in touch, keep in touch, um, follow up, um, let's stay, work together. I, I'm starting a comp I started a company, a movement, blah, 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 the neoliberal corporation. We have feeds and posts and journals. I'm working on books and other books and thought. We, by the way, the plan is to, create a Caribbean thought and theology journal of young academics, which include you guys, which we're going to publish once a year or on a quarterly basis. And this particular study we're doing, the findings will be in there. Um, if you have done any papers, the interaction paper that you guys are supposed to give me, by the way, if you haven't submitted any interaction paper, please submit those. They are also part of your grade. Um, so some of you haven't presented, sent me any paper yet or one or two of you but remember to submit that um we, sir so, so i'm supposed to submit the paper that i presented yes okay okay, okay. yes um, submit the paper you presented um the one on, on what was the first one again define caribbean theology and the second one was what again chantel Avolium, do you have it i mean take spirituality Kamitic spirituality. Kamitic spirituality, but it was three questions. Watch, watch the video on Kamitic spirituality or the podcast. I interviewed, I interviewed the high priestess, the high priestesses. So when um and I and I presented it. So read it, um follow up with it, and um share the podcast. Subscribe to some of my feeds and my shows, guys. Support black business. Support Caribbean business. Support your people. Okay, this is important. All right. Any last words from you guys? It was good to have the class. So, so unfortunate it was summer. I know. I have. Um, yeah. I, I wish it, it was like first semester or January yeah. second semester. But summer class is not something that I love. Yes, yes, yes. I'm happy I taught this class actually. Um, uh, because I even gleaned more stuff. So, you know, I wasn't going to teach it at first, and I said yes, but I'm so happy I did. And the way how it went, because, we, you know, so it was fun. I really love this class. I, the ability to teach Caribbean theology. And um, I, believe, I hope that you guys will, you are so empowered that you will also take this message. You continue your reading, continue 
to develop your awareness and of continue to develop your own understanding of all things and then and then share it share it with others have facilitate discussions don't lord it over others this is what you must believe oh, oh what you have makes sense oh, i'm passionate about what i teach okay I, yeah, and I'm a debater and I'm passionate and I will speak passionate about this, but I believe God has given me a prophetic message. I really think so. I confront my mom the other day. I said, mommy, don't be a hypocrite. <laughs> I did. She's 79. I said, what you guys practice, what you guys are doing now, your grandmother would be like, oh, you guys were upset because you guys are perming your hair now. Back then that was ludicrous. <laughs> I feel like, you know, that's true, actually. Yeah, okay. But part of what has dogged us in Jamaica and the Caribbean, it's this colonized, colonized, this project that the British people did on us and the European people did on us, which make us look, can't even accept our own selves. Some people go as far as to bleach themselves. That speaks to the issue of value. And, and our theology, that's supposed to rescue that. Our theology still can't go beyond the Eurocentric, Eurocentrism that is creating this unacceptance. People devaluing themselves with the fact that they have to bleach their skin. Even the Jesus is, they go to church and worship. The ideal savior is white that we look upon the cross. We can't see that the Jesus that we are being sold was a Jesus that's cultural. The Jesus of the Bible is white because that is the Jesus that the culture that gave us salvation sells us. They can't see a God outside of what they look like. But we still run and accept that. It's quite... I, you know, and, I'm, and when you study Jamaicans, Jamaicans are so unaccepting of themselves and each other. We are, we are so we can, and we are so critical of each other. I'm telling you, if we were more united and look beyond these cultural, these this these selfish, the selfishness and the pride. We okay. By the way, the, the kind of in, independence and freedom that we inherited was the same one that. That we that we experience one of selfishness and pride and think that some people are better than others. I am not better than you. No one is better than the other. But we have that to our detriment. We say that, oh, Jamaica have the most churches per capita, but we are one of the, our, we have our crime and violence is among the highest in the world. Why? When we promote when we, have, when we have more churches and a, a gospel of love, the same gospel that we promote, is the same church that we promote that, 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 that started slavery and wipe out a whole set of people. <laughs> okay. That is not the love. That's not the kind of love uh, that God promotes. What is the ultimate of all things? This is where I end. The ultimate of all things is that we become one with reality in all of our individuality. And even if we may have one idea of God, we can't, ask, okay, it is always good to remember that we are human beings driven by selfishness and pride. We must always remember that God speaks to us wherever we are, wherever we are. And we must always remember it is not man that we worship, it is God. May your struggles keep you near That's it. The, the last statement was prose. It is, okay. <laughs> Let us pray. God, we thank you for this amazing class, an amazing time. May you open our eyes and our minds to all things. May we be united. May you help us to see the things that keep us divided and work together to bring about common understanding and interests so that we can serve the world today to solve tomorrow. 
and challenges. Yes. May you embolden us. May you surround us with your love and your beauty. May you grant us your favor. May you cover my students, those who are me and uh, Howard and Karen and Williams as men. May them, may you make them into stronger men, powerful men, victorious men. Keep them safe. Bless their families. Give them the desires of their heart. Help us not to be puffed up, but help us to be humble. But help us to be excited to share what we have learned. Because to whom much is given, much is required. Keep us safe from all harm and danger. And may we share the gospel in such a profound way, a gospel of love. We thank you for what you will do in us and through us. We thank you for the blessing you will continue to show up on us. And help us not to keep the blessings for ourselves, but help us to be help us to be too quick to share it with others. Remember, remember people in our family who are struggling financially, emotionally, medically. We pray you keep them safe. We pray you empower them. We pray you help them. We pray you bring healing. Because we believe in the power of the divine. But we believe that you are than that which nothing greater can be conceived or imagined. You are the limitless God. No, that and is not what the thing I... is, no matter what culture we find ourselves, one thing is certain that there are, there are those who have been telling the powerful story of a God who has intervened in such a powerful way in their lives to have changed the script, to have brought some value and inspiration to make life better. We are people who want to make our lives better, not just for ourselves, but for others. And so may you also intervene constantly in our lives to make ourselves better, but not just for ourselves, but for others. We tell you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Take care. Keep in touch. Yes, okay. Sir. We're still doing and a study. Nice meeting you guys. Yeah, man. We may meet again. We may arrange a meeting where we can, when we are completely finished with the study, probably we'll have a, a big conference or a big meeting or whatever to discuss our findings, all of us together. Okay. The Caribbean theology and the Caribbean thought class, summer semester. I would love so keep in touch so that we can um, come back together and have a discussion like this. Hey, sir. Yeah. We have a group. Do 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 I, do I had so many challenges? I, at one point, I said, "Man, I'm gonna quit summer because summer just not summering." <laughs> you know, um, you know, yeah. I was getting, I was getting so much, so much. I don't even want to call it fight, but so much opposition and oppression. And yes. especially some of my, my supervisors, you know, as it regards to school. And, you know, there were days and I should have left school, um, work early to be home in time for school. And yes. I said, no, I'm not going to even fight with you guys because this is something that is coming and it, 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 it's inevitable. You can't stop it. Yes. This is by whichever means. And so... <laughs> So, you know, I just also want to use the opportunity to apologize about, you know, coming to class so late so many evenings and sometimes. It's, it's, it, has, it has been an uphill task for the last couple of weeks. And yeah. I was up till, uh, well, you would know, I was up the night before yeah. and, and last night, I was up till about three o'clock. I, I ended up going. Yes, to I work. saw that. <laughs> right. I ended up going to work. Because I had to find a solution because I was borrowing a computer. Because I was in class that, um, about two weeks ago with Mr. Hall. And my computer just barely just slipped. It didn't fall, you know. And, oh. I, and, and I don't know if in grabbing it, the screen mm. just, 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 just broke. And then the ink just started running. So last night I was here saying because I had another, I had a, another assignment for, for, um, apocalyptic um, literature and say so I need to get this off completed because as I said 
going to work, being at work till 6.30, sometimes 7 o'clock, you know, and, and then to come home and to, it, it has been a struggle. Last night, now I hooked up the uh, HDMI that I have on TV for my cable box to the laptop and voila, everything came up. I was like, so last night for the whole time, I was sitting in front of the television doing the work till the wee hours of the morning get it off. So now, now that I have this option, what I'm going to do is to spend some time tonight to, to get the, um, the two interaction papers to you. Also do the survey, send it to, to my colleague. Hopefully they can get it back to me. And let us yes. uh, get what, what I need to to. to um, come, come, I, I appreciate yeah, it. Good, I, appreciate I move right out of um, Caribbean thought, right into Caribbean theology. It was a little different for me last semester in terms I had more time and leverage. Uh, yeah, you were very involved in Caribbean thought last semester. Right, because even when I was driving, I was still on and, you know, participating. Yes, yes, but yes. I said this, this semester has been a challenge. Um, Summer okay. semester is always difficult. I never liked doing classes for the summer. I hated the summer. Oh, I hated summer. I hated summer semester, but I've had some summer semesters, but that's why I pick and to be honest, I pick, I'm very careful with the professors I choose. I do not, there's some, I know, I. that's why I do investigations and I'm like, I'm not doing that class. This semester. Oh, she's going to teach that class? Mm -mm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. So I look look forward to if you have any courses courses coming up in 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 September um, that I'll be a part of one. But well, I think some of the students want me to teach other courses. Yeah, the other theology thought class students. They were saying, "Do you have any?" I'm not sure. I have a meeting with the vice president later on. I'm mm -hmm. going to meet with the vice. I'm going to talk with um, Winston and Stephen and the president Stephen. So I will. I will see probably, I understand that they are doing Caribbean theology again, so I may teach it up in the upcoming semester. Um, and uh, I don't know if they haven't asked me to teach any other course, but to be honest, what I want to do is I want to write some courses. I, I was looking at the syllabus. I think JTS needs to update its syllabus, like in terms of the, the courses, the course offerings. Um, they need to revise some of the courses like Caribbean theology needs to be revised. I did some updates in terms of how I taught it just now, but it needs to be revised. It's it's archaic. Um, you also, we need to do some more. I mean, it needs some work. The syllabus, we have to, JTS needs some more courses and on the cutting edge, which it's lacking. Yes. Somebody had their hand up. Oh, they were just agreeing. The JTS needs some more courses and... Um, so I am working now to develop some syllabus. Not only that, I'm trying to expand JTS in terms of creating a Caribbean thought journal. So JTS will have a Caribbean thought and theology journal, and we will publish that journal probably towards the end of this year. You guys will be the student, will be, some of your work will be included in that journal. And moving forward every year, we will have a Caribbean thought and theology journal that is put out by the Jamaica Theological Seminary. I will, um, that's why I'm meeting with, with the president um, and I will help with the publication because the company I own, we are publishers, we can publish. So we are developing the publishing capability of JTS as a, because the plan is for JTS to become a university. Part of becoming a university means looking at the very foundation of your institution, what you offer and understanding the field of academia and where it is going and also, and so on and so forth. So, so that is important. So as an academic institution, you want to have a printing service. You want to offer printing. Printing, you, UWE has one. JTS has been around from 1960s. Up to now, we don't, we don't have a printing service where students can submit stuff and get it published and so on. We have to have that. If I don't do anything for JTS, it's, it's just to develop our publishing capabilities, one, and to develop a Caribbean thought and theology journal that is published every year. That is my goal. That is my plan. It is going to happen sooner than later. And hopefully you guys, when I come to Jamaica, will be part of the whole conversation around that. Okay? It is important as a premier 
and leading evangelical institution in Jamaica the Caribbean, and the Caribbean, and one of the oldest. That is the plan, okay? So eventually you will see, we will work on that. Um, I was on the steering committee as the secretary, or the, I was on the executive steering committee when we relaunched the student association, but um, I had a fight and I left. Because <laughs> the students, they thought I was too radical. I don't know, that's a problem. I don't know why people, I mean, can I tell you, Caribbean people know how to shoot themselves in the foot. Anyways, this is where we end. Take care, guys. Walk good. See you in Jamaica in I think yes, sir. In a month's time. Take okay, care. see you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man.